Hello there, and thank you for tuning in to Town Meeting TV. My name is Bobby Lucier. Uh, today, we are talking about a food access initiative in Burlington, uh, and we're lucky to be joined by uh, a local uh, activist and organizer, Lena Greenberg. Thank you so much for joining us, Lena. Thanks so much for having me, Bobby. It's awesome. great to be here. Great. So, uh, let's first maybe just uh, step back and ask, like, who are you, and where uh, did you? How did you come to Burlington, and what um, what brought you here? Sure. So I live downtown. I'm an organizer and a writer. Um, I grew up in New York City and spent a lot of my working life learning about the climate crisis and cities and what happens when those two things get put together um, and thinking about, you know, what's the rest of my life going to look like? I was born in the mid-90s. Our generation is one that's going to be defined by the climate crisis and how we choose to address it or not. After doing mostly global and nationally focused climate organizing, I'd been looking at climate maps and thinking, okay, I really would like to be, like to be doing climate organizing in a place where I feel connected to community and place. Um, and also kept seeing the Champlain Valley pop up on those climate maps. Six of the 10 most you know, climate safe counties in the country are in Vermont, whatever that means. Obviously, after the catastrophic flooding that the state saw in the Winooski watershed and elsewhere, we have to ask questions about what it means to be climate safe. But as I was kind of looking for a place to put down roots and really, really get to work, I thought, okay, there's a lifetime of work for me in Burlington in thinking about how we can both weather this crisis in the long term and make this a safe place for people who both are already here and escaping from less climate safe places um, and balance that kind of short term support for people who are trying to meet basic needs and the long term transformative change we need to you know, do okay as the world keeps changing. Yeah, there's there's definitely something in there about uh, doing climate organizing in a place that is deemed climate safe and also has climate risks associated with it. There's a certain kind of bundle of, the, there are tremendous privileges in the place that we live and there's also still a lot of work to do. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of, I mean, did you, move here knowing that you wanted to do organizing work when, when you came Definitely. here? Definitely. Yeah. 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 That, that makes sense. Um, and so one of the projects that you've worked on while you've been here has been a, a free food map in Burlington. Yes. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about how this project came to be? Sure. So I moved up here in spring of 2022, started a job at the Interval Center doing food access work. And because I was going to be providing free food programs, I thought, let me get a sense of who else is here and what else is happening in this town along these lines. We have an incredible community of people who are making free food available, who are you know, saving it from going in the compost, who are preparing it and making it easy to you know, pick up and, and walk away with, even if you don't have time to cook or a place to cook. Um, there's, there's such a density of free food in Burlington. It's kind of astonishing. And as I started to learn about all of these programs and mutual aid groups and churches and community centers that are providing free food, I thought, is there a place where all of this information is collected? 2022 was defined by being a couple years into the COVID pandemic and was a, at least in the spring, was a moment when we started to get inklings that the federal state of emergency was going to come to an end, which would take away with it so many programs and services. So. There, are all, there were all these resource lists, and once I started asking, you know, where's, where's all this information collected, I got sent a bunch of resource lists. And then I thought, is anybody updating these? Are they still accurate? Is this from, you know, April of 2020? Are these programs still happening? And then I was shown the, the digital version of the free food map, which is behind us, which also seemed like needed a little TLC. I thought, okay, let me spend some time gathering more info and, and trying to figure out where the, where the food is, how easy it is to get, what are the dates and times, all of that. Awesome. And so, and so you've started there, and that was in 2022? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and what did you uh, discover as you were pulling together all of these different uh, sources of, of free food in Burlington? It seemed like a lot of the lists were out of date. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of work, um, especially if you're you know full-time providing social services or you know, full-time running a food shelf or any of a number of kinds of work and, and jobs and volunteer gigs that go into providing food and other services. So I thought, okay, let me 
let me call everyone and see if they're still providing the services that they're providing. Um, and then once I did some info gathering, I went to the Food Not Cops free lunch, which is such a community resource. They've been doing it for, I think, years now without missing a day. Um, and that's all volunteer folks. I went to lunch and I said, you know, would it be useful to have an online map or a printed map? And everybody kind of looked at me and was like, why not both? So I thought, <laughs> okay, this, this map has existed. It's open to everyone to edit. It belongs to the community. Let me go in and add some stuff. And then I ended up um, taking some time to make this printed version, um, which there are two sizes. This one is one side is the map. The other side is the legend. Um, and then there's another one that's a little bigger, more of a poster experience with all of the information on just one piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's an incredible, very robust resource. There's a lot of different sources from a lot of different partners, a lot of different groups that are doing this work. Can you talk a little bit about um, just sort of the diversity of collaborators on uh, in, in the food access world in Burlington right now? Absolutely. These these providers really run the gamut from like the full-blown food shelf at Feeding Chittenden, which is also the Community Resource Center. You can get so many needs met there. There's places like COTS, um, which provides the day station. You can go and take a shower and also get a hot meal. And then there are things like free pantries, which nobody is at, but people will drop things off and take what they need. And then we've got you know, the Food Not Cops free lunch, which happens every single day um, at the Cherry Street Garage. We've also got the People's Kitchen, which is all over town, you know, at, at protests and NPA meetings, and also at their distributions in South Meadows and Salmon Run. That's also volunteer. Um, we've got things like the Veggie Van Gogh, and there are, you know, pantries that are often replenished by entities like the, the Food Bank, the Vermont Food Bank, and the Interval Center. There are distributions that both of those entities run. I'm trying to see who else I'm missing. And then there are so many other kinds of meals at churches, at the Salvation Army. Um, there's one at Vivid Coffee. Um, there's, there's really an incredible diversity of providers who I don't think are all talking to each other because doing this work is hard work and you don't necessarily need to, um, but it's, I find it really humbling to see all of, the, all of these options in one place talking to each other in the context of the map. Yeah, uh, I, I know there's, well, I'm sort of wondering as this, I mean, there's so many resources and there's also still a lot of hunger and food insecurity mm -hmm. in Burlington and across Vermont. What do you see as some of the biggest challenges to, uh, improving food security in our community? It's a, it's a really hard question to answer. Um, and one I think anyone in the food world is asking, there's kind of the, the charitable food model, which is more of, more of like, we're gonna, we're gonna give food for free to people who are in need in a way that fundamentally fails to question why people don't have enough food in the first place. And then there's you know, more of the food not cops model that, that kind of says, you know, this, this food is free and everyone is welcome. There's no means testing. A lot of the programs and a lot of the providers on here don't do means testing. They say, this is, this is for you. If you feel like you need it, come and get it. Um, it's very hard to assess if needs are being met, in part because those needs are really diverse. Sometimes it's, can you get food that you recognize and that you know how to cook? It, sometimes it's, do you have time to cook? Maybe you have all the food you need, but because you have to work two jobs and you have a couple of kids at home, you just don't have the time to prepare food that you want to eat. Then there's, you know, do you have access to refrigeration? For folks who are in the, the hotel motel program or who don't have a place to live, um, what, what are you going to do with fresh vegetables? That's not really helpful to you. Um, so I think the, the biggest challenge is kind of identifying all of the different kinds of need. And it's, this is a huge, hugely challenging thing to talk about. Um, if you're someone experiencing food insecurity, it's a huge vulnerability to say, here's the kind of help that I need. Um, and also, I would say, you know, if we were providing everyone with universal basic income to make sure that people could meet those needs, um, food insecurity is connected to all sorts of other challenges like housing insecurity and the high cost of living and the impossibility of affordable health insurance, like all the things we talk about as, as challenging working families in our in our city and in our country and in the world are they're all entangled and providing free food is a wonderful way to you know prevent total disaster but it's i think part of a at, at best the beginning of the transformative work we need to do to protect people and make make life livable yeah yeah so 
let's take a look. So now uh, we're, the, uh, the map is kind of moving around behind us a little bit here, but there are a few different symbols here. Can you walk us through what's going on on this, on this map here? What are the different symbols here? Okay, let's, let's see how I do on this quiz. Um, I believe that we're seeing symbols, great. Um, we're seeing symbols, some of which indicate hot meals that you can either eat in place or take to go. There are some kind of little free pantries and places you can get dry goods. Mm -hmm. You can get um, more perishable goods at certain locations, whether that's free veggies or um, like free grocery store kind of experience at Feeding Chittenden. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll, I'm just gonna cheat on my paper map. Um, <laughs> the categories on the paper map are veggies, pantry items, and meals. Mm -hmm. And then some of the color coding on the, on the online map is about, you know, some, some services are more identity specific. So we've mm -hmm. got Spectrum, which serves youth 14 to 24. And then the Heinenberg Senior Center has a couple of different offerings for folks of different ages, mostly people over 50. Um, it's important to have these things on the list because you have no idea who's looking at the map. Mm -hmm. um, and also useful to note, you know, if you're, if you're 45, you probably shouldn't go to Spectrum. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. good thing. Good thing there's a lot of options there. Yeah. Have you heard any sort of feedback or story? Like, what's your dream scenario of how this map is used? And do you know if it's reaching the people that you like it to mm. reach? That's a great question. It's hard to know, and I am I am just one small part of this incredible, large complicated food ecosystem. Um, the, f the online map, when I first looked at it in 2022, when it wasn't being regularly maintained, I think had four or 500 views. Now it has over 35,000. Wow. So it's getting looked at, which on the one hand is great. We want to have resources that are used. And also it's pretty upsetting to think about our city of just over 40,000 people having a map that's viewed 35,000 times. Like, what does that say about our city and how well or, or not well we're doing at taking care of people? Um, I think any, any tool is as useful as the people who use it say it is. Um, I know that some people are not comfortable like looking at a paper map and saying, okay, I'm standing on this corner, I'm facing this way, it's over, it's over there. Um, and I think, you know, using, using a map is both kind of rooted in cultural and generational um, contexts, I'm sure this map is not serving everyone as well as it could. And of course, like, this is just in English. And then, you know, it raises the question of what happens if we're, if we start translating the map and then someone who does not speak English shows up somewhere that they've read about on the map and then is not able to receive that service because there's no translation service there. So mm -hmm. these are, these are some of the questions that I've been asking myself. Um, this is just a graphic, so it can't be, it's not legible on a screen reader. Um, I think the, the Google map is probably a little bit more accessible in that way, but there's, there's so many ways to slice and dice information. Um, and, I think anyone in the in the free food ecosystem welcomes more tools. At the same time, I think part of why the the online map and the printable map get sent around so much is that we have this nice little tiny URL. If it's easy to access, um, it's easy to share, and that's how that's how tools get spread around. Yeah, you touched on it a little bit, but I'm wondering if you can talk a little a little bit about the distinction between food access and food sovereignty or um, what and food apartheid how how were you're thinking about um, the food access movement kind of evolving mm -hmm. and what it looks like for um, our you know to envision a future of uh, food security that is sustainable for our community sure the food system we have is, basically designed and maintained by people who are trying to make a profit. And that means that we're deprioritizing meeting people's needs from a, a hunger or a food perspective. And we're saying, how can we squeeze as much money out of people as possible? And, you know, basically create a high bar for entry on having your food needs met. If we're we're wasting all of this food. We have inflation, which is driven by corporations. We have, you know, high costs of, of other things like housing and gas and healthcare, all of which kind of end up in this situation where you're like, oh, you, you don't get to eat unless you have money, unless there are these other entities that are basically deciding who gets to eat and who doesn't. And it's tremendous in Burlington that we have so many mutual aid groups and, and organizations and other folks who are saying, doesn't matter who you are or what you have, come and eat here. Um, 
but food security and food sovereignty to me speak of a system that is designed and oriented to meeting people's foods, food needs, not making a profit. Um, and is, you know, at best in, in collaboration with, with farmers who are being paid well for their work and who are able to steward their land in the face of a changing climate, making sure that we're, we're growing food in such a way that's in alignment with, with our climate needs and our food needs and is affirming life of humans and other species who are implicated in our food systems. I, I'm curious when, when something like this comes up also in our sort of Vermont community being so, uh, there's a strong culture of local food systems. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a sense of how many of these locations, food sources are using or trying to use local foods and just how you weigh the decisions of, you know, are, are we, uh, by, you know, so often the cheapest available food is mm -hmm. the, you know, the food that's part of a larger food system that mm -hmm. is also uh, degrading um, either our local environment or environments right. on a larger scale. Right. So how do you think about meeting, lo uh, you know, food access needs while also, um, you know, trying to resist that larger system that you mentioned? Sure. Food that's cheap is artificially cheap. Um, and that unfortunately also means that if you don't have a lot of money to spend on food, you're forced to buy the cheaper food, which then externalizes all of those costs onto the workers who are having to spray pesticides or you know, work in on, on monocropped fields that get washed out by a heavy rain because there's no, there's no structure in the soil. Um, or you know, corporations that are both squeezing laborers for wages and also making sure, you know, not, not tending to their land. So it's, it's so important to weigh all of those factors and so many of our free vegetables in town are from local organizations like the Intervale Center and the Food Bank that are gleaning from local farms. This is a great way to get people local food. Um, I love the People's Farm Stand model. They are able to pay a lot of farmers for their contributions, and then people can still get that food for free. It's incredible that farmers offer surplus to gleaning organizations and also farmers farming is so precarious and farmers don't make a lot of money especially if you're doing right by the land and the food that you're growing so kind of triangulating all of those all of those tensions and all of those demands on limited resources is incredibly challenging and then there's a question of you know a lot of a lot of immigrants and refugees in Burlington are are wanting to eat food that's in season here like six weeks of the year. Mm -hmm. um, these are the tomatoes and the eggplants and um, obviously potatoes and onions store a little better and can be available in the winter. But if, if we're just prioritizing local food, then we have to deprioritize providing food that's culturally relevant and the, the food that people wanna eat. If we're saying, oh, we can't provide you tomatoes in January, people still wanna eat tomatoes and then you, there's all of those those challenging choices to make. So what I what I would love to see is a a city in which we are making sure that people have the food that they need and supporting farmers who are growing that food here, um, especially in the era of a changing climate. That also means I think ramping up production of storage crops and hardier foods like rice and beans and potatoes. Um, thinking about growing in such a way that is climate adaptive and keeping an eye on where our floodplains are and making sure that farmers have the stability they need to weather a literal storm um, among all of the other challenges that, that come with farming. Yeah. Are there in this project also, like how many of these sources are uh, sort of community gardens or like communally owned farmland that are um, producing f food that is um, then contributing to food access efforts in Burlington? Or is that, is that kind of a, a far away sort of vision or is that something that's like happening in our community right now? That's a great question. I think a lot of that work happens on an even smaller scale than is represented at, on the free food map. Although I do know that Feeding Chittenden often kind of puts out a call in August when a lot of prolific home gardeners are like, oh my gosh, we have so many zucchinis or so many, you know, I guess zucchinis a little earlier than that. But you get the picture. There's a moment when a lot of home gardeners say, wow, we really have a lot more than we than we can eat. Mm -hmm. And then there's a call to bring that extra produce to Feeding Chittenden. Um, and I, I would imagine that 
if you're a home gardener and you you're, you have a, a lot of surplus, you can bring that to a food pantry or, a, sorry, a little free pantry or a little free fridge. Um, it's amazing to have these kind of little tiny pieces of food infrastructure all around. So if you're a person who is walking down the street and needs some food, there's a little free pantry. You don't have to like check the hours or make sure that you're here at the right time or place. Um, having a lot of different kinds of food infrastructure is so supportive to, to food access. Yeah. And do you think, I mean, what's the path forward for food access? You've mentioned a lot of this here, but do you think that there needs to be an increased investment in our food system in one way or another? And where do you see that investment being most necessary um, to meet the food access needs in our community? There is so much work happening on this right now, which is so essential because the climate is going to continue to change, which is going to continue to make our food system even less stable than it already is. Um, and then we have the work of almost like deglobalizing our food system um, and bringing bringing our food production circles in closer um, and making sure that we're not externalizing all those costs of you know mistreating workers or mistreating land. Um, the there's a lot of work being done on a 10-year food security plan for Vermont that's um, kind of getting toured around the state. The Vermont Farm to Plate Network facilitated this process, and there's a lot of organizations and individuals who have been a part of that process. Um, and what I, the way I would quickly summarize that plan is that there's a kind of balancing of short-term needs and long-term change. Like we need to make sure that people are fed now, and then we need to build food systems that are resilient and accessible and you know, safe and welcoming for everyone. Um, there are so many other parts of the food system that we kind of don't touch in the food map, like SNAP benefits, which got really drastically cut in March of 2023 when the federal state of emergency did end. Um, that meant that people who were already probably not getting enough in SNAP benefits were then struggling even more. We have a 185% of the federal poverty level threshold set in Vermont. Um, states can raise that to 200%. That's a potential place for, for expanding access to those benefits. The, the screening process to get access to SNAP is pretty robust. And then, you know, there's weighing of, you know, how much money do you have and make and how, what are your expenses? And really, we should just make it easier for people to get food. Um, I would love to see universal SNAP if you're making below a certain amount of money, which is way higher than their threshold. I mean, we could we could dream all day. Um, the the food security plan has um, data data driven and community driven approaches to to both meeting those short term needs and and pushing for that longer term change. Right. I know Farm to Plate has they they've been working for a while on Vermont's food system and kind of mobilizing statewide support for different action, I remember being surprised. It's not a very high percentage. The, the amount of food that we eat as Vermonters, as a, as a proportion, uh, the proportion of that that actually is grown in Vermont is fairly small. And it's actually yeah. large compared to the rest of the country. Right. Um, or, you know, in terms of what you might expect for a state of our size and of our population, but it's only like maybe 20% or something like that. Yeah, it's incredibly low. Yeah. And I, I would love to see us just set our standards higher. Mm -hmm. We are never going to get anywhere if we don't say, oh, the bar is here. It actually has to be up here mm -hmm. if we're really going to transform how we use land and how we feed people. I would love to see an assessment of how we use land in our state based on climate impacts and climate benefits, supporting farmers who are making sure that their carbon is staying in the soil with, with cover crops and you know making sure that they're preventing erosion and preventing, um, you know, agricultural runoff from going into our lakes and uh, our lake and our rivers um, is so important. And, you know, it's all it's all part of the puzzle of how we how we adapt to climate change and the climate crisis. But, you know, I have to wonder, like, what if we had more clay plain forests and fewer, you know, foraging grounds for cows? And then maybe some of that land is also in veggie production and thinking about how we how we shift the mix of what we're eating and where we're getting it from is such a huge project that so so many people are are dedicated to right now yeah well thank you for chatting about this i know there are a couple other things that you're up to and one of them is 
sort of a community journalism project, right, called the Burlington Eye. Can you tell us a little bit about that project? And I know that's just now getting yes. off the ground here, but tell us a little bit about the Burlington Eye. Sure. So the Burlington Eye is, as you've said, a data-driven community journalism project. Um, it's a couple of us on the editorial board. It's um, just a kind of a ragtag group of people who have a lot to say about what's going on in City Hall. Um, as, as you all know, at Town Meeting TV, community journalism is so important. Um, and city council meetings are long and sometimes they're also incredibly boring. So our, our intention at the Burlington Eye is to provide a little bit more of an accessible way to know about what's happening in City Hall, to provide some, some ideas and food for thought um, in, in considering what's happening there and saying, oh, you know, we've, we've got this incredible new mayor, there's a lot of work ahead for our city. We have this huge budget deficit. We have a housing crisis and a public safety crisis and the climate is changing and you know, all of, there's so many, so many moving parts. Um, and hopefully the Burlington Eye is a home for some of us to offer some ideas and, and kind of a framework for, to help folks think about what's going on in City Hall and hopefully move people to be engaged. Yeah, that's that. I mean, we are thinking about that all the time here. So it's very exciting to hear more and more folks think about ways to engage uh, the Burlington community and the wider community in our civic process. There are really important decisions being made all the time that are uh, influenced by the voices of the few folks that show up to the city council meeting. Sometimes it's Absolutely. more than a few folks, yeah. but, but yeah. sometimes it's not. And yeah. uh, so it's, it's exciting to hear that um, that kind of project get off the ground. So. Congrats yeah. on starting. Thank that. you. Who, yeah. So, can I ask who else is involved in that in that work with you? Um, so, it's myself and a couple of other folks who I became close with during the last campaign cycle. Mm -hmm. um, where our names are on the website, if you want, um, and some of our names are not. There's, <laughs> you know, politics is such such insider baseball, and it's it's with our money. So, it's I think really important to have have people offering commentary and we welcome guest writers and more collective members. So if anybody who's listening is excited to join us, um, please get in touch, burlingtoneye.org. Um, and we're, yeah, we're really just getting off the ground here trying to trying to find our place. But thus far, the response has been really positive. Um, people are saying, thank you so much for explaining what happened at that meeting, um, which is such a such a wonderful thing and, and makes me think we should we should keep up the good work. That is awesome, and I'm excited to continue conversations with you all about uh, shared goals of, of allowing further engagement in Burlington politics. That's awesome. So Absolutely. Thank you, yeah. Lena, for, for joining us and for chatting about all this awesome work that you're up to. Thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate it. And thank you for tuning into Town Meeting TV. Uh, you can find this program and many more uh, at cctv.org or by tuning into Town Meeting TV on our YouTube channel and on Comcast 1087, Burlington Telecom 217. Uh, thank you for tuning in and so long.